Yesterday, a new trailer for the movie The Northman, directed by Robert Eggers, written by Eggers and Sion, dropped. I mean, we have another new high-profile Viking movie. Since then, I've been pretty much inundated with pings and requests of what are my thoughts, so here you go. The Northman appears to take place circa 900 in Iceland, primarily. It follows a young, quote, Viking prince named Amleth as he seeks to follow the death of his father Eirvandir by his uncle Fjölnir. If this sounds familiar, that's because it is. The names, and it seems at least the bare shell of the plot, are adopted from the Book 3 of Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Denorum. Hamlet is better known by his name in English, Hamlet. This is just Hamlet, but Viking TM. But the idea of telling a story with a revenge plot itself is actually fine. Uh, there are a whole lot of sagas that do this. Uh, the primary idea of the saga period is the feud, and the primary unit of the feud is the revenge killing. So this is pretty standard stuff. The first scene to talk about is right here at the start of the trailer. You can see we've got the nice round shields, conical helms, all that jazz. The banners that they're using are, however, actually sort of historically attested. They're clearly based on the raven banner design found on the uh, Bayou Tapestry that is usually associated with the Ragnarsons, uh, or with Harald or Hardrauda, but the idea that this is a more widespread thing is a bit of historically accurate iconography. The bigger problem I see here is, one, the idea of a large fortification like this in Iceland circa 900, because we are clearly in Iceland here, and two, the stupid blue filter. This blue filter annoys me so much, it's a thing historical films love doing. It just saps all the color out of it. Viking Age society is defined by color. I want to see more gold on Oervandil and his retinue. I want to see shinier outfits, brighter colors, brighter dyes. And the blue color seeps all the saturation out of it, so you can't actually enjoy that, even if the rest of the reconstruction is actually pretty good. See, like... Look at young Amleth here, you can see the very edge of his tunic being this bright red with an embroidered fringe, and then a gold brooch with then a very detailed uh, herringbone style clo wool cloak over it, and then this furry cap. It's all good! That's all historically proper materials, it just, you don't get to see how cool the colors are because of the blue filter. This is one that probably a lot of people won't like, but... I actually do. The idea of this really heavy, like, sheepskin cloak is not necessarily attested, but also not implausible. And the, uh, spectacle helm with the Aventail is basically the Yedrin Boo helm from Sweden. It's a historical find. The thing I don't really get is why the figures with the hooded cowls have these, like, face masks with eye holes in them. But it's designed to, I think, be just intimidating and spooky, and for just a moment unknown. And so, whatever, it's a cool visual. I'm actually not too bothered by this one. And Björk is a priestess of some kind. Uh, it's not immediately clear in the trailer whether she's supposed to be some sort of seeress or vilva, or whether she's supposed to be a representative of some kind of Dees family spirit something. I have mixed feelings about this. Obviously, in a somewhat meaningful way, this is contrary to one of the few descriptions we have, and with so little color in the scene, it's hard to really make a sense of what's going on. But at the same time, uh, these are not bones that you're seeing, these are beads, looks like mostly amber or shell or white stone, which is actually totally fine. And then the idea that if they are doing some sort of uh, communication with the spirits of the land, so the land Vaihtir, uh, or other ways interacting with harvest rituals. The idea of a headdress made out of wheat stalks 
though not really possible in Iceland on the grounds that wheat doesn't grow, uh, is not in and of itself an impossible or historically out of the realm of possibility thing. I just really wish we had more color to see better what's going on here, but this one actually seems to get something cool. Because there's a few scenes in this, there's one a bit later too, where they seem to show an understanding that Norse ritual practices are just really weird. And that's cool, a lot of things will lean into sort of the blood and gut side of it, and not just the general, all of this is really kind of bizarre and disparate from modern ideas and weird. And this seems to do walk that line reasonably well, actually, uh, of being both recognizable to modern audiences, even though it means it leans a little bit into vaguely shamanic ideas, which is not accurate for Norse religion at all. But at the same time, it seems to have some understanding of what types of weird are correct and what types of weird are not. So the plot here seems to suggest that after Fjörnir kills Oyrvandil, that Amleth, instead of just pretending he's crazy living at home, being super disheveled, covering himself in shit, all that uh, that's in Saxo Grammaticus's book 3, uh, he instead goes into exile, lives somewhere else. This is not unattested in the sagas, but it's pretty rare, right? The best attestation I can think of off the top of my head is Sigurd the Dragon Slayer after Sigmundur's death. Uh, he is born in exile, raised in fosterage in a different kingdom, the kingdom of Denmark instead of the kingdom of the Huns. But this sort of going to exile after the slaughter of the father is much better attested in Middle English romances like King Horn or Havelock the Dane, so we seem to be getting some influence from medieval English literature as well, which, again, given that it's Hamlet, you know, one of the most famous works of English literature, I'm not mad by. There is clearly overlap between continental romance traditions, especially these early Middle English ones, and Norse traditions, so it's fine, it's just interesting that they seem to be drawing on disparate influences there. I'll be honest, I don't love this one. I do not love this image. There's a few things going on in here that are all super weird. First one I want to highlight is actually the tortoise shell brooch. Uh, uh, that is primarily a feature of women's garb in the Viking Age, so I'm not sure what the heck it's doing dangling from this dude's uh, cloak brooch coat thing. Second thing that's weird is uh, the mummified head. While preserving heads and consulting with them is attested in Norse mythology, most notably according to Inglinga Saga, uh, all then preserving Mimir's head. That's not something we have a whole lot of evidence for. Uh, decapitation is not a super common thing uh, in the Viking Age, though it does happen on occasion. It doesn't necessarily seem to be for uh, explicitly the goal of preserving the head and then using that as part of later religious rituals, so much it is, it is political statements. And then the third thing that's weird here is the birch bark tab with the Galdra staff on it. This is not a Galdra stuff that is attested in the Viking Age, right? It looks like, though it's not immediately clear, that this is supposed to be uh, basically the Aias Hjalmur. Uh, specifically, though, it's the version of the Aias Hjalmur that's found in the Hold manuscript, which dates to the early 1800s in Iceland. So we are solidly almost a thousand years out of date, and even if we accept earlier forms of the Aias Hjalmur, uh, the farthest back you can realistically push this form of the symbol is the 17th century. There's a, a different variation that's given the same name that dates into the later 15th century. She seems to be some kind of sorceress, given that it cuts immediately hereafter to a volcano erupting. As she says, quote, she has the cunning to break men's minds. I mean, I'm glad that they have magic, right? I don't necessarily know that this exact type of magic is going to be 
right for the period or tone uh, saga style, but I'm glad that they have magic. Even the most grounded of the sagas, uh, something like Nyao Saga or Eil Saga, is just obsessed with prophetic dreams, doing magic of various kinds, curses, prophecies, all that stuff. So, making that a normal part of what they're marketing as a sort of historical-ish period piece is something I genuinely like, right? Just go all in on it, acknowledge the fact that magic was a real part of this culture's day-to-day -day perception of reality, and make that a good thing, right? I'm totally okay with that. So, in this section, they basically confirm that they are treating Amleth as one of the Ulfjadnar, which translates roughly to Wolfhide. These were probably a historical group of people uh, that Roderick Dale argues were a sort of elite champion figure, which I'm inclined to agree with. Uh, but the going about naked part of this uh, seems to be pretty much adopting Snorri's account of the Berserkir as sort of the retinue of Odin who go about naked and are otherwise so violent in battle that it takes uh, literally like fight until they drop dead after way too many wounds. Uh, they could also, however, I think be adopting something from Volsunga Saga here, specifically part of the tale of Sigmundur and Sinfjotli. In that, th uh, they find magical wolf skins, they put them on, they literally turn into wolves, and go about marauding and slaughtering a bunch of Sigger, the man who killed Sigmundur's father Volsung, uh, kill a bunch of his men, and generally wreak havoc. This does, however, end badly, and they end up uh, burning the wolfskins after a bit, after Sigmundur nearly kills Sinfjotli by uh, ripping out his throat as a wolf. You know, kind of a problem. I don't love that they're adopting this, though, because the Ulf have not have a very problematic reception uh, in modernity, being kind of the favorite part of the fascists, and so I hope they're doing things to break this down and to make this movie more unfriendly to neo-Nazis than it looks, because this could get really ugly really fast, given that everyone in here is super duper white, and they're leaning into a lot of these pop cultural hypermasculine ideas of what a Viking prince is supposed to do and act like. We'll see though. Eggers has a lot of experience and has made some really interesting movies, so hopefully they're like aware of that potential risk and take steps to subvert it. This silhouette is neat. Uh, this silhouette is pretty much exactly derived from the Vendel period, so pre-Viking, probably 6th or early 7th century, Erland stone, which shows a dancing man with a horned helmet that has exactly this form. It also shows someone who's either wearing like a bear head or a wolf head. It's not super clear which, it's probably a bear head. Uh, so that definitely seems to be a source of visual inspiration for this. I also really like the fact that they're dancing with the shields here as part of this ritual. While this is looking a little bit, you know, drawing on influences pre-Viking Age, it is something that is definitely on vibe for a sort of pre-battle or warrior ritual, uh, akin to the sort of shield biting or testosterone increasing uh, rituals that Roderick Dale argues are seen in the Saga Corpus among the Berserkir. So, this is potentially something really cool, in another case of they understand what types of weird are correct, versus what types of weird are just a bunch of modern invention that don't actually get the vibe of the period quite right. And then we get this sort of dream sequence with what looks very much like a Valkyrie. If we back up just a little bit here... Uh, please do it? Nope. Too far. There we go. You can actually see she has teeth modifications. This is actually good. We do have uh, archaeological evidence for these exact sort of filed teeth, these modifications. So while the whole thing looks very kind of pseudo Wagnerian with the bright color, the uh, plate vest, and then the uh, warrior woman 
riding off into a storm. It's all very Wagnerian, very Valkyrie, but also is grounded in something, uh, something interesting, and if this is a sort of dream sequence, a uh, sort of prophetic dream, it actually would be very much in line with something the sagas do repeatedly. So in other case, yeah, where I'm actually not mad about this. And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, there's a lot to see. I'm actually looking forward to get more information about this to see if the things that I'm worried about get fixed or acknowledged or some way dealt with. But they do seem to have uh, some sort of understanding of what the saga style actually entails versus it just being uh, pretty much telling Hamlet in a historical period. I am worried mostly about the hypermasculinity uh, that they're giving Skarsgård. While that's not inaccurate per se to sort of the Viking or medieval English romance style, it is still worrying and potentially problematic in modernity because, like, while it is cool to see someone try and turn, uh, a narrative from the period and the uh, plots and themes and uh, social norms of the period into modern media. At the same time, I'm worried mostly because we are not the 13th century, right? Uh, Saxo writes down the story of Amleth around 1200. The story is probably somewhat older than that. So, potentially an oral tradition that does go back to the Viking Age itself. It's been almost a thousand years. We don't have to tell the same stories, and our understanding of the period is very different from what people's understanding of their past was in the 13th century. We don't have to tell the same stories. We can tell stories that highlight the diversity, the other forms of contact, and not discount the violence, but just tell more interesting, detailed stories around the evidence we now have for the period. So, I'll, I hope they subvert their own revenge plot. It doesn't look like they're doing that right now, so that's worrying. But it looks like there's some evidence here to say that this might be one of the better depictions in film ever of pre-Christian Norse religions. And some of my religious studies friends are really looking forward to this. So, we'll keep an eye on this. It's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, and I am going to be cautiously optimistic. Though, I am a little bit annoyed that they're just doing Hamlet again. Instead of one of the other 150 saga options that they had. Ah oh, well, so be it.